So I wanted to thank Myra very much for inviting me to be here. It's an honor to be here with someone like Rich Payne and Kathy Foley and people whose work I've admired for so long. So I really appreciate having a chance to talk to you about my chronic pain problem, which is specific to me, but it's not unusual for what other pain patients experience. Um, Myra's instruction to me was to keep it lively because it's after lunch, <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of hard to do, but uh, I thought I had some kind of audience participation. I was recently at a town hall at the University of Maryland where all the 20-year-olds, if they like what you're saying, they start snapping like crazy, so feel free to snap. Um, uh, and I, on my slides, there's nothing for you to take notes from, it's just pictures. So. Um, and my talk is called A Snip of the Tongue, My Journey in the Land of Chronic Pain. Um, that's my granddaughter. <laughs> I could work her into anything. <laughs> so, uh, um, but it's, I'm, I have this picture because my chronic pain condition is in my tongue, which was damaged during a minor oral surgery procedure that nicked the nerves in my tongue. So it hurts all the time. And, um, and I'll stand here and talk, but by the time I'm done talking, my mouth will be killing me. But you won't notice, because it's invisible. Um, her newest trick is to stick out her tongue at me. So I'm glad that hers is healthy. Um, I've started making drawings of her. That's the two of us with our two tongues sticking out. Because of the procedure I had, now I can stick my tongue out. It just hurts all the time. Um, like I said, my story is particular to my body and my mouth and my experience, but it really reflects what 100 million other people more or less experience, um, which is that we have limited access to effective treatments. When we seek treatment, we're shamed, stigmatized, marginalized, disbelieved, disregarded, and just really, may, you really feel like you just have to beg all the time for somebody to believe what you're saying. And that's not exclusive to my experience. Um, on the low end of the estimates, I've heard that it's 25 million people who have really severe chronic pain. And that's the population of the city of New York. So if you try to picture that. I was thinking that 100 million people would be 1,000 FedEx fields full to capacity for a Bruce Springsteen show. That's a lot of people. Um, and I also think part of the reason that people with pain tend to be invisible to healthcare is that we're, um, we're afraid to speak out. We're out on this lonely planet. We don't want other people to know what's going on with us. Some people risk their employment by admitting to the treatments that they're undergoing. You risk being judged by people who wonder why you can't just suck it up and get on with it. And um, I think that's why you don't hear lots of pain patients speaking out. The other issue is that um, I'm lucky because I can still walk, even though my mouth hurts, but it doesn't affect my mobility. And a lot of other pain patients are um, homebound, bedbound, like the woman that we saw in the film last night with the shotgun pellets in her lungs. They, I'm sure they would come and speak if they could get out of the house. So I feel that I'm offering a voice to a lot of people who are otherwise invisible. Um, I wanted to tell you that I play lots of roles other than being a person who has chronic pain. These are my six children, um, so I don't identify myself primarily as a pain patient. I'm a wife, a mother many times over, a grandmother, a daughter, a sister, a friend, an employee, a citizen, like everyone else who lives with chronic pain. It's not the primary role I play, but it takes up a lot of my life. Um, I, so I wanted to tell you a sort of a humorous story. I hope you see the humor in it. Um, it's about the the desperation that pain has left me in. Um, in March, I was at the Lown Institute Conference in San Diego, which is about reducing overtreatment and overdiagnosis. And uh, if you want to join the Right Care Right Now movement, check out the Lown Institute. I decided to take a walk and um, take the ferry to Coronado Island one morning. And it was really beautiful out. I live on the East Coast. I was really happy that it was a sunny day. And, um, this man came running by and I said, oh, it's a beautiful morning, isn't it? And he stopped in his tracks and he said, it really is a beautiful day. So we started talking. And I said, well, do you live here? And he said, no, I run a pain clinic in Oregon. And I was like, <laughs> wow. And I was really surprised. And he was in town 
for an acupuncture co um, conference to learn more about acupuncture for pain management. So I said, well, that's odd. I have this pain problem. I told him what had happened to my mouth. And he said, and here we are on this pier in San Diego. And, um, he said, well, would you mind if I do a few manipulations to test your pain? I was like, oh, no, go right ahead. And so I held my arm out. He pressed my arm down. He, he pressed all these different things. He pressed my stomach. And then he goes, I have some of these ta this tape that I've invented. And he pulled it out of his pocket. He said, would you mind if I put some of these tapes on you? And I was like, no, go right ahead. Feel free. Um, he said they, they were just activated mineral particles. I'm not really sure what they were. So he put one on my neck, and he said, I really should put one on your stomach. So there I am with my overweight, roly-poly self. I pull up my shirt on the dock. He sticks one on my stomach, and we both go on our way. Later that night at the Lown Institute, I was telling somebody this story. He was a doctor, and he said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> Do you, you don't know what's on that tape. You don't know what you're absorbing. You don't know if he's just some crackpot. The guy, I mean, he was the chiropractor for the United States Olympic team, so he didn't seem like a crackpot. Um, but this physician was very concerned that I was inadvertently absorbing some kind of poison, so I pulled all the tapes off and threw them in the trash. Um, and instead, this is what I rely on. This is my arsenal, this blurry picture of all the pain pills. Um, that are, they're kept in a locked box because that's part of the contract with my pain doctor. Um, so the other thing that happened that night at Laum was I met a man who was a doctor. Um, he's the chief medical officer for a very large insurer in California. And he said to me that they were doing a lot to reduce the opioid epidemic through his insurance company, which is going to start restricting access to prescriptions. So what, a lot of what you've heard this morning. So if they just simply stop filling the prescriptions, they will solve the opioid crisis in the state of California. And um, you can imagine this really pissed me off when he said that. And I said to him, well, that you might be really well intended, but you are really misguided, and you're going to hurt people like me. And I said, I have this pain problem. I take opioids for it. I do all kinds of things to cope with it. And he said, and I said what medicines I'm on, and he said, you shouldn't be on those medications. You don't have cancer. Um, so I mean, that's the kind of thing that I face whenever I reveal to somebody the types of medicines that I take. Hold on, I have some notes I have to... Um, oh, and, and then more recently I was at a journalism conference and one of the journalists said to another journalist, this is Janice, she's written about her pain problem, and the other writer said, boy, I sure hope you're not taking opioids. <laughs> I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. It's the only thing that seems to help. And she said, well, you don't have cancer. And I said, no, it's true, I don't. And um, so she followed me through this convention hall, lecturing me about why I was so wrong about what I was doing. And I said, well, you know, I find a little relief when I go to Zumba classes, then the pain goes away for like an hour and a half. And she said, well, then you should just walk on a treadmill four times a day, and then you could stop taking your opioids. I forget, I didn't ask her where she'd gotten her medical degree, but it was tempting. <laughs> Um, so what triggered all my oral surgery problem, the, I was having some problem with this thing under my tongue that hurt. And the oral surgeon and the dentist and the doctor said, if they just took a snip of this thing called a frenulum, that it would feel better. And I'm not a healthcare professional, so to me, just a snip meant, you know, just a snip. It, actually, this is what they end up doing. They cut out a whole thing underneath your tongue, and then they stitch it up. To me, that looked like more than a snip. Um, and they think that those stitches wrapped around some little nerves and just damaged the nerves. Um, so I thought I would draw a picture for you all of what my pain feels like. It's uh, these little green men have um, torches and nails and chains, and it really hurts. And I put this on a Facebook site um, for people who have burning mouth syndrome, and I said to them, oh, that's what I look like on a really bad day. Well, I don't see it. Well, anyway, I asked the, this Facebook group of people to say, what am I missing in the description of our pain? And 50 people wrote the things that I should also add to my drawing. But I didn't, because I'd already made the slide. So um, they wanted me to be breathing fire and all kinds of just agony. And, but nobody can see it. Um, 
At one point, my employer didn't quite believe that I was feeling as miserably as I felt. So I texted her this picture. I said, I assure you, I really am not up to coming in today. The, it, the thing with pain that hasn't really been touched on, um, but the costs come up. And in 2013, the year when I first developed this problem, I was never hospitalized. My bills were $30,000 um, for my treatment. So pain is a very expensive condition. And fortunately, I have good insurance. Um, but I've lost a lot of things that I really love or that I enjoyed. So um, it hurts to eat. Food doesn't taste good. Nothing tastes good. Vanilla ice cream tastes OK. Um, it, it somehow is tied into my sense of smell. So certain smells make my mouth hurt, which really irritates my husband because he likes to cook with garlic and onions. And it just kills me. Um, a longtime friend of mine ended our friendship because I kept falling asleep when I would visit her. It was early in the course of trying all these different medications. And she felt that I just wasn't being strong enough. Um, so it was the end of a childhood friendship. Um, kissing hurts, but I thought maybe I'm too old for that. So, um, but anyway, pain is a really difficult condition to live with. Mine, I'm sure, was exacerbated by lots of stresses that were also going on in my life at the same time. My brother-in-law died unexpectedly. This is our organ donor medal um, for making him an organ donor. Um, a young woman fell in my house, sustained a TBI, and died a year later. So I was living with a lot of stress that I'm sure made the pain even more difficult to get under control. And, um, oh, and in answer to the other writer's questions, I consulted lots of experts, and I saw the head of oral maxillofacial dentistry at the University of Maryland, who was the one who explained what had happened with the um, stitches. And he referred me to a neurologist, he referred me to, I think, a pain expert. I, I was referred to many different doctors, but luckily I had the oral surgeon who felt so badly about what had happened that he would call the doctors and say, you really need to see this poor lady. And they would see me. I eventually wound up with um, a doctor named Dr. Cope, which I thought was maybe a good omen. <laughs> it was not. Um, I, I was, um, I saw her a few times, I don't think I, uh, oh yeah, so every time I felt like I was getting up, I got knocked down again. And um, meanwhile, and it, all, the t all the while this is going on, I'm still taking care of my kids and working full time. My commute was two hours each way, which is a really long commute no matter how you feel. And um, <laughs> My supervisor um, eventually just became really irritated, I think, with some of my absenteeism or my needing to work from home. Um, she complained that I was frowning too much and that I, I looked like I was smirking all the time. So um, I left that job. Meanwhile, back at Pure Pain, um, Dr. Cope suggested that she try this um, intervention, a stellate ganglion block. And, they stick you here to get at a little nerve that's behind your um, larynx, I think. Every time I had that done, I had to have my mother or husband come with me because they would knock me out to do it. It was a very expensive procedure because the anesthesiologist had to knock me out and monitor me, and it was miserable. The first two times that she tried it, um, I felt a little better, but I think that was probably the, um, having been knocked out, I just felt better. The third time, it actually made the pain worse, and that was about the end of what Dr. Cope had to offer me. And so she started um, having her nurse practitioner see me instead. I also had to go through this ordeal that someone talked about of pharmacies not filling prescriptions. And um, the area where I live is kind of the epicenter of the heroin um, epidemic in the state of Maryland. So. Um, Every time I would go to the pharmacy to pick up my prescription, I would have to negotiate with the pharmacist. And at one point, the pharmacist started yelling at me across the counters that he was not going to fill this prescription. And I was just mortified by his behavior. And he called the doctor to debate the prescription that was to be filled. It was outrageous. So I decided I would just use the drive through pharmacy so I wouldn't have to deal with him. So he actually came to the drive through window to yell at me. And I finally said, you know, I said, I know what this is. You're not concerned about my safety. You must be under investigation by the DEA. 
which in fact he was. So um, anything you do like that, though, puts you at risk of being labeled as a drug-seeking, pill-popping you know, person, not someone who's really just trying to cope with your pain. I don't remember, I can't, oh yeah, that's me just messing around with my kids. I also tried to maintain my sense of humor throughout this ordeal. Um, oh, and the other thing I was gonna talk about was the cost. So every three months when I go to the pain doctor where I have a contract, I have to have this urinalysis, mostly to make sure that I'm taking the drugs that they're prescribing. That costs my insurer $1,000 a month. And um, when I questioned that, their response was, well, you could find another pain doctor, which they know I couldn't do, because then I would be doctor shopping. So I was really stuck in this practice. And I know because of the Facebook group I belong to that I am not the only person who runs into this again and again and again in communities across the country. And one woman, I actually wrote to Myra about this, because with the new DEA regulations, you have to be seen in the doctor's office every 30 days. And this woman, to get to the doctors, needed a private ambulance to take her mother, which was like a five-hour round-trip drive, very expensive, it was just totally out of reach. They finally agreed that the doctor would predate her prescriptions for a three-month period. Illegal or not, it was the only way to get around that hurdle. Um. Meanwhile, back at Cure Pain Management, the nurse practitioner put me on a drug cocktail. By then I was so rattled, I didn't know what I was doing. And so at one point she had me on um, oxymorphone, clonopin, Ambien, Ativan, and an antidepressant. Um, there's a two week period that I don't remember at all, but my sister reports that I was no longer speaking English. <laughs> so that's when I knew I had to change doctors in that practice. It's also when I realized that the medicine alone was not going to heal me, so I decided to write my story for the journal Health Affairs, which is a peer-reviewed journal. So I wrote an essay for Narrative Matters um, that ran in Health Affairs and on PBS NewsHour and in the Washington Post. The comments on that article were something to behold. Because everyone who, most of the people who come, there were people who would comment and say, you know, I really, um, these were some of the comments I got. I think you can read them from where you are. Some people would say thank you for putting a voice to this story, you know, thanks for telling your story, thank you for writing about these problems. But more often, people would write and say, stop complaining, suck it up, get on with your life. It's, it's astonishing how quick people are to judge others when they don't really know what you're suffering from. Finally, when I decided I would have to just become my own advocate, I just decided I would start doing things that I loved again. So I went to a Janis Joplin show um, where everyone stood up and danced and we pretended it was 1968. And my mouth didn't hurt for a whole day and a half. This is like the day after the Janis Joplin show. When I actually had a little glimmer of what it meant when I had heard from experts that it's a biopsychosocial problem that needs um, a whole person approach. So for me, one step was um, music. I like music. I started um, taking trips again. This is my 13-year-old. We went to the beach, sitting outside in the sun and the, the surf and everything. Being out in nature helps you feel better. I like to knit, so I've now knitted hats for everyone in my community. If any of you would like a hat, <laughs> let me know. That's the baby again with the hat I knitted. Oh, these, this slide got mixed up. These are some of the comments about my um, burning tongue picture. But you can, I just wanted you to see like the sheer number of comments of people with their suggestions. And at Cure Pain, I didn't realize this school was an osteopathic school of medicine. And um, so the young person there to my left is an osteopath with a, who did a fellowship in anesthesiology, Dr. Fu. And he finally is the person at Cure Pain who sees that I'm actually a person, not just this pain. And so when he comes into um, check me out, he, he will actually talk to me and ask me what I'm doing and what made me feel better the previous month and what might help next month. And his office has a pharmacy downstairs, and so that's the pharmacy team. And so I go to them, and they don't yell at me. They just fill the prescriptions and ask me how I'm feeling. That's made a huge difference in my ability 
to cope with my problems, that I don't feel like I have to go in and beg them to fill the prescription. Um, oh, I started drawing, so I've been making little drawings of things because art, art therapy, music therapy, all of those things help people with pain uh, reconnect with something in themselves that makes them feel human again and that connects with the spirit of who they are and not this physical manifestation of some misery. And I think I wanted to end by telling you um, a story about my daughter, Allison, but it might make me cry. Um, she's 21, and she has a chronic pain problem. And uh, the only lesson in my pain is that I understand hers now. I think I might have been someone who said, suck it up, get out of bed. Yeah, she has fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue as a result of a tick bite. And I go with her to her doctor's appointments, where the doctors have literally come in, shaken hands with her, and said, <clears throat> there's no such thing as chronic Lyme disease. You need a psychiatrist. My total disregard for the fact that she's a young person with a terrible illness. And so um, the only upside I can see in what's happened to me is that I'm better equipped to help her. But it's a shame that it would take that much to learn what people are suffering from. This is the illustration from the Health Affairs article. It's kind of how it feels. You're just in this vise with politics and the uh, opioid epidemic. You're just being crushed on all sides. Really, all you want to do is live your life. Pain really prevents that from happening for a lot of people. Um, so I thought I'd go back, I thought I'd end by telling you about the bolt tape, the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey would say. So I took all that bolt tape home. I said to the guy when he emailed me to say, did it work? I said, well, I decided maybe you were a quack, and I threw it all in the trash. So he sent me a big package of them, which I started distributing to people in my family, because they all had aches and pains. And they would all say, that, that thing really works. So I've got my 13-year-old wears them in his soccer games, and Allison wears them at night. And I mean, my feeling is, when you have chronic pain, if something helps you, it helps you. And so for someone to say to me, opioids can not help you. You don't have cancer. Well, I don't know. Do you live in my body? I mean, it's just whatever helps, helps. Um, and, and there's one other thing. Two weeks ago, BMJ, the British Medical Journal, released a case study of a woman with burning mouth syndrome. And they treated her for two months with antivirals, and her burning mouth vanished. They think it could be that um, the herpes simplex 1 resides in your trigeminal nerve, and some sort of stress can activate it, and it affects your tongue. So I immediately went to the ENT and told him this, and he researched it, and he said it sounded plausible, so he's having me try it. But other people in my Facebook group have approached their doctors who just kind of disregard them and dismiss it and blow them off. And so I'm kind of the guinea pig for the Facebook group to report to them if I actually start feeling better. And I'll just keep doing whatever it takes to feel better. And um, so I wanted to say also that um, for those of you who don't have any kind of pain problem, any day of your life it could be you who joins this unhappy squadron of people. I hope it's not. I hope that we find ways to care for people like my daughter. If it should happen to you, I'm easy to find by email. Google me, and I'll be happy to listen. Thank you. Sure. If you'd like to ask me questions, as long as they're not medical questions. <laughs> Only things that I'm qualified to answer, I'll answer. Sure. I don't have any bolt tape with me, though. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Lynn Webster, I think uh, uh, I was introduced earlier uh, today. Um, I'm sorry that you've experienced what you've had to experience. I have had three or four patients in my career that uh, have struggled with that, and unfortunately, there are no good solutions, or are not many yet. Um, I'd like to know what you've done that you think it has been the most therapeutic, and what type of sleep quality do you get? Oh, oh, I didn't think about that. Um, for me, the best thing, the thing that helps most of all is exercise. I actually went to an event at NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and I heard a guy, Dan Claw from the University of Michigan, talk about his theories of pain management. And he talked a lot about exercise, closing the pain gateway, and things like that. So 
then I really, you can't tell it to look at me, but I really started to exercise a lot more. And I think in Zoom, but I can actually just feel it kind of slide away. And I think it's because it's this really happy, festive atmosphere. So I just kind of forget about it for a minute. Um, sleep, early on, before I found any effective treatment, sleep was just impossible, which was worse because the only time it doesn't hurt is when I'm asleep. You know, so it's this terrible catch-22, which is when the nurse practitioner nearly killed me with a triple the dose of Ambien. Um, she prescribed 12.5 milligrams for a woman my age, the, the amount is five. So after that near-death experience, I um, didn't want to take Ambien anymore. But Dan Claus suggested Flexeril, that he recommends that for people with this kind of pain, and um, that allows you to get some restorative sleep so when you wake up in the morning. The sad thing is, for a long time, every morning I wake up and think, let this be the morning that my mouth doesn't hurt. But that morning hasn't come. Sure. You have people that say, oh, it's no problem, I go to Walmart and the people are nice to me, and other people that have worse experiences than you, or would you say it's uniform that the people with chronic pain that you can't obviously see on their body, like they're in the late stages of cancer or whatever, and you, you know, there are people that look as healthy as you that are also in the late stages of cancer, and they're going to have those same problems when they go to a pharmacy. Could you share a little more about what you're hearing from your community out there? Well, some and of thanks the, for sharing oh, everything because so it's far. Facebook. You know, it's an international community. So the people in, but mostly it's just Europe and the United States and Australia, and the Europeans have a really hard time getting any kind of opioid. Um, so they're all they're always kind of jealous when the Americans post whatever we're taking. But lots of other people have mentioned the problems they have getting their prescriptions filled. Um, Someone had talked about how you kind of have to play the part for the doc. So when I see the doctor, I don't want him to think I'm just whining and complaining. So I always have to act like I'm feeling very rational and happy, even though I might feel like crap. Um, because otherwise, he won't think that I need the medicine anymore. So I really, um, I don't think I'm alone in that. I've heard other people tell similar stories. Um, my friend Ray Barfield, who works with um, Rich, told me that the worst thing in the world to be is a young African-American man with sickle cell disease in Durham, North Carolina, who shows up in the emergency room and needs opioids. Because then you are surely a drug-seeking, drug-addicted person. So, um, so that's why I kind of think it's not an isolated issue. How helpful is the encouragement from people who are not in chronic pain? <sighs> kind of funny because my mom also has fibromyalgia. Yes, will you repeat it for us? Oh, how about encouragement from other people? Like my daughter, Allison, doesn't really like her friends to know what's wrong with her. But the problem then is they leave her in the dust when she goes like to the Ferguson marches and things like that. She gets left behind. So she's sometime in a, sometimes in a wheelchair and then they remember that she doesn't feel well. But she doesn't. And I said to her, maybe if you told your friends, they would have some more empathy. But I think they're so young, they just can't understand it. Um, my feeling was I didn't want people to feel sorry for me or have to accommodate me. I just wanted them to know why I couldn't eat what they had fixed for dinner, why I was, had such a frowny face. Um, so I guess the, sometimes it's encouraging just to have people say, I know you're doing the best you can, which is what I often do for my daughter, is just to say to her, boy, you really have gotten a lot done today despite all the challenges that you live with. And I think that helps people. We have time for one more comment. Teresa? I am Teresa Bain. I'm a chronic pain patient and part of pains um, with Myra and Cindy. I myself recognize what you're saying and feeling like nobody understands because I physically look fine. I've been dealing with complex regional pain syndrome now for almost nine years. And let me guess, it's went from my left arm and now it's all the way down to my toes. There's not a day you wake up that you don't feel something. So to hear that there's encouragement and some of the stuff has been a little nerving um, to have to hear that the people that are treating us are having to battle so much. So us here at Pains here in Kansas City are making a stand 
and I encourage you to uh, have your patience come and be a part of us because we are advocating for a better life for us chronic pain patients. When I noticed, um, when my article came out and people would say, you know, I, I can't talk about my pain problem because I'm, you know, their job would be in jeopardy. Or um, I, I ran into a woman at the gym and she said, I saw your article in the post. I hope you don't drive anymore. So you just run into that kind of mi misinformation that's really difficult. And it's a double bind, you know, if people did speak out and then they risk a lot of their security. So I appreciate